Right. Hello again, everyone. Happy Thursday. Um, as you might have noticed, I have created your assignment number five and also your proposal, which is assignment seven. And I have, as you have seen my email, I have assigned you to uh, six group, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, and I have picked among those who are in one group, I have picked one of the proposal as uh, the project uh, to pursue for each group. Um, so any question for yes, the project? So if you go to iLearn, there is a section for project and you can see um, all the description detail for the project and also deliverables and also the deadline. So the deadline is, I think, December 16th by midnight. Uh, don't take my vote for it, just go and figure it out yourself on, on your website on either. Any question? Is everything clear for the product? Any question for assignments? All right, so let's get started with our lecture today. You should be able to see uh, the lecture material I have already uploaded there. Oops, it's quite it's so I'm going to close this one. Okay. So as you might have, um, Remember from last week, we are still in the nonlinear programming or nonlinear optimization models area. This is going to be our last actual lecture for the nonlinear models, optimization models. Uh, today, we're going to do three kind of different examples or application of nonlinear programming. Um, the first one we, we did a couple of things last week or two weeks ago, if I remember correctly. Um, this is the TV ads model. Um, we did it for a linear programming, a linear function. We did it also for a, a, a logarithmic, natural logarithmic function. Today we're going to do it actually for an exponential function. Um, and we're going to do also some other applications such as um, investment portfolio optimization and facility location. Okay, so let's get started with the ad selection model. So we're gonna do, this is the same actually problem. So the, the data are the same, the problem is the same, except that for the exposure function, if you remember, so just to give you another, um, remember what the problem was, we actually have a company called the GFC, the General Flight Corporation. Uh, they wanted to, um, what their decision was to put advertising on popular TV shows. Um, and they had some constraints uh, on the different demographic groups that they have. If you remember for women and men, different age groups. So we had the actually 60 demographic groups, three for men, three for women. The key assumption was the total exposure increases linearly with the number of ads shown, which is um, not really true. Um, like if you, if you're exposed to an advertising uh, for time, your exposure number to that is not going to impact you uh, the same amount uh, as the number of exposure. What I mean is like, if you watch it six times, it's not going to be twice as when you watch it three times, okay? So it's not really linear, but in that um, example, if you remember in that lecture, we assume that it's linear. Um, we did actually a logarithmic work, natural logarithmic work. So today we're going to do an um, exponential function. So the new assumption in chapter seven, which is nonlinear optimization model, you know, the total uh, exposure increases less than linearly, which is uh, more practical uh, than the number of ads. So if one person sees the same ads five times, this should count as less than five exposures. Um, all right, so nonlinear response function, 
Uh, so you see here, and this is practically what we are trying to achieve here, is to show you the exposure function here. Um, so we assume here that it's not linear, and we want to try to estimate it using a, an exponential non-linear function. So you, in the table, you see two columns. The first column shows the number of ads shown. So you see from the 1, 8, 20, up to 100. And then the second column shows the exposure y. Um, so that's actually the impact that does have on you. Uh, so for example, um, the number of ads is one, x and y. So x is the um, kind of the input and y is the output or the impact. So for one is 4.7, for eight, when you multiply it by eight, y does not multiply by eight actually. As you see, it's almost five times. Um, when X increases, the number of ads increases to 20, um, it increases more than two, actually twice as, as eight. Uh, but as you see here, there is not a linear um, marginal increase in the exposure Y values, as you see. So if we actually graph these numbers here, X and Y on this graph that you see on, down below, so the x-axis shows the number of ad, uh, ads on the x-axis and the y-axis shows the y or the exposure y. As you see here, it's not linear. Uh, it's actually kind of curved down. That means that the marginal impact of the advertising is going to shrink down, okay? So it's a decreasing marginal impact. Oops, that's non-linear. So what we wanna do, we want to estimate this actually function. Um, last time we did it with a natural logarithm. Today we want to do it with exponential function. So many functions could work. We did it with logarithm function, natural logarithm. So today we want to do the exponential function. For the exponential function, we're going to use actually this function. Um, y of x is equal to a multiplied by the like, a multiplied by one minus e to the power of minus b multiplied by x. So a and B here are the parameters that we want to actually find. Um, and X is just the um, number of advertising and Y is the exposure, okay? So that's the function. So we are trying to actually fit this, the best function by trying to figure out A and B, knowing that we have some historical data for X and Y, okay? So this is a kind of a regression uh, type of estimation function that we did um, the other lecture at the other lecture also for the linear function that we um, so we want to find the best fit function by manipulating a and b finding the best values for a and b so that we find um, a function um, that fits best of our data um, so for example here we try a couple of random values if you have zero ads so x is zero so e to the power of zero that's one uh, one minus one is zero. Zero multiplied by any value is zero. So that means that when you have no ads, exposure is zero. Okay? So that makes sense. Um, so that's the least possible exposure that you can have. You can have zero, zero not cannot have negative. Um, and if you increase the number of ads, uh, say go to infinity, uh, hypothetically. Uh, so if in x increases to um, to infinite, uh, e to the power of negative infinite, that's approaching zero. So your exposure would approach this to A, actually, when you have infinite number of ads. Okay. So A is called the saturation level, which is the maximum number of exposure possible. And B is just the rate at which Y, X, or exposure approaches the saturation level. Okay. So B is the rate and A is the saturation, right? Hope oh, everything is clear so far. So we are trying to find A and B, A and B here for our exposure function. All right, so we're gonna do the same thing that we did before, except we're gonna have a different model, which is this, um, this function. So we're gonna try to find A and A, A and B so that we're gonna maximize the effectiveness of this function based on all the data that we have. All 
All right. Okay, so let me open up the You can actually download the, I have made available the lecture materials, so you can actually download them and, and follow with them, um, especially if I download the, right now, the download the done version. So I have opened the NLP example six at response data. Let me share that with you. So this is the Excel file for, and for the data, I'm going to save this. I wouldn't lose it. Um, I'm going to put it in my delete folder. All right. So this is the function that we want um, to bet, find the best fit for. Um, y of x, which is the exposure equal to a multiplied by y, one minus e to the power of negative b multiplied by x. Um, and this is going to be, a, a and b are going to be our uh, decision variable in this optimization. So, so our optimization is to find the best fitted value for a and b for our function to um, fit, uh, have, have the best fit for our data based on our, our previous or historical data. Okay, so that's a kind of, kind of optimization, right? Um, and what we can do is to manipulate A and B so that um, the deviation or the mean square root um, for um, any point of our historical data to the function that we have fit should be minimal, right? So that means minimizing the summation of deviation of these two data. Data points. Okay. So these are our historical data. We have like one, two, three, four, five data points here. And these are the number of ads. And the next column shows the exposure. Okay. And this is shown here on this graph right here. You see on the x axis shows the number of ads placed. And on the y axis shows the exposure, um, which is millions of all. Millions of actually um, viewers. So, how should we approach? Based on um, different values that we try for A and B, from A and B, which I'm going to show you here, which is going to actually our decision variable, I'm going to find the fitted um, function. Right? And this is how. It basically is the same function that you can see here. It's going to be this function. Um, let me make this different color, not the whole. Professor, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but on iLearn, I'm actually not able to find the ad response data. I'm only able to see ad response done files. Okay, let me, let me check. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, there's the ad selection data file, just not the response one. Uh, oh, the data, yes. John, John, okay. I right, thank you for letting me know. So ad response, the data is not there. Uh, let me edit here. Uh, it should be available now. Thank you, Professor. I see it. All right. 
Um, this is very annoying. Let me mute um, my email. All right, okay. Uh, back to the lecture. Uh, so this is the function, the function that you see in the red color um, the font here. Um, so y of x exposure equal to a multiplied by one minus e to the power of negative b multiplied by x. We have x values here. Uh, we have also y values. So using this function, we want to find the est our estimation. We don't really know the function. I mean, maybe there is no function. What we have is historical data. We have historical data for the number of advertising that we do and the number of exposure that we get, okay? Um, so using this function that we try to estimate, we're trying to find um, you know, the relationship kind of, right? Um, so we're trying to find A and B that we get the best estimation for that relationship, okay? Um, you know, these are just random values here. Uh, I could go with anything you can just delete them, but it would become zero. Um, uh, I'm gonna go say with one and two. But also remember that um, with nonlinear programming, your initial solution can impact um, your optimal solution or how much time it's gonna um, actually take to achieve that. We also have some in lower bound and upper bound on our decision value. So A and B is our decision value. Well, I'm gonna use the uh, range names to name these. Um, so A is between 50 and between between 50 and 250. So minimum of lower bound 50, upper bound 250 for B is the minimum um, for the lower bound is 0.001 and the upper bound is one. Okay? That's actually the only the, the only constraints that we have for this decision value. So this is our decision value, and these are our input data. So we want to try to now get on with our uh, computation. All right. So first of all, we need to estimate the function. So we're going to find a couple of data points so that we can find the data points for our estimation of relationship. And then we figure out the distance or deviation of that our estimation and the real values. Okay. So what I mean is for a specific x, the number of advertising, we have the real values of exposure, which is we have gathered during historical data, and our estimation using the fun this function, okay? And then um, we can find actually the error, the, the deviation for the, between the actual value and our estimation. What we are trying to do is to minimize um, the summation of the square root of deviation by changing the values of um, a and B, that means defining the best value for A and B so that um, we get the best fit function or the best estimation of this relationship. Okay. So hopefully that's clear. Um, so here for the fitted Y, that's actually going to be using this red function. So that must be A, which is here, multiplied by one minus the XP of uh, negative B and X. Okay, so that's what you see here. Okay. So a, which is this, let me actually do this instead of good luck. I, I could actually name A and B here and it would be actually easier to read. Um, because I, um, I'm not sure if we have to mess this up, but I'll give it a shot. So let me do it here. So that would be A multiplied by A multiplied by one minus the XP of negative B multiplied by X. C 
So I got actually the same value as you see here, right? So that's the same value. Um, Professor, I think the X might be the incorrect uh, row. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to I wanted to actually do it for the X equal to one so that I compare it with uh, the formula that didn't have the, um, you know, the first formula just uses the absolute values of this cell. So I, I, what I did here, I actually used range names for A and B, so it makes it easier to read, right? So this is better actually, so I, I, I like this better. So I'm gonna copy this here. My apologies. Uh, no problem. Um, so now I actually, I can edit this down and this is much better. I can drag it now down. So that's for, I'm gonna get rid of this. Um, so that's our estimation of our exposure, okay? So this is the number of ads, X. This is the actual exposure. This is our estimation of exposure using this function, given that A is one and B is uh, two. So if I change these values, actually I'm gonna get, um, different values here, as you see. You also have to make sure that we have a feasible solution. That means A has to be between 50 and 250, B has to be between 0 0.1, 0 0.001 and more. Um, all right, but this is not true, so I'm gonna go with 52. Okay. But, um, so that's our estimation. Next, we need to find the deviation of our error that we have made, okay? So that's easy. Um, that's just a di the difference between the actual value and our estimation um, is square. Okay? So now I can actually drag this and copy them down so it computed for all of these values. Okay. So this is, as you can see, this is not a good estimation. Um, if I change these values, it's gonna change. Um, anyway, I can't like, you know, as you see, this is not really a very simple problem that just by random, um, picking values for A and B, I can get a best estimation, right? So what I want to do is find A and B in such a way that uh, this, the, the red plot kind of overlap or get close to a good estimation of the blue uh, plot here. So the blue plot is our actual values and the red one is our estimation. So this is, this is actually going to be a great day because after I solve this optimization, um, it's gonna show you um, this initial solution and the best fix, actually best fix solution. Okay. So um, these are the error for each estimation. Next, we need to find the MSE, then the mean squared error, which is just the MSC function or, or the average. These are, these are all already, these values are already squared. So what I need to do is just find the average of these values. So this is the average squared error or the mean squared error. And I need to just find the square root of that. So SQRT for the two that's a lot. And, and it makes sense because as you see, this is a terrible fit. This is a terrible estimation of the real. Okay. Um, I think we are all good, so I yeah, it's just gonna name this RMSC so that this is going to be our optimal solution or, or going to be our um, output. So our what I want to do is I want to minimize this value, which is the mean, the, um, the square root of the average error, the average error, um, by changing these two values of the. So let's go ahead and try to solve this problem. I can actually name also this so with an octagon. So it would look better when I put it in solver. Okay, so objective is here. We are minimizing it by changing these two values, A and B. 
and the constraints that we have is A and B has to be less than the upper bound, and they has to be less than greater than the lower bound. Okay, A and B has to be positive. So this is checked. I'm gonna to go to the options because this is a nonlinear programming. I'm gonna go here and change optimality to zero. Um, I'm not gonna use multiple starts. Uh, let's see how much time it's gonna to take to solve this problem. So just pay attention to a and B here, the objective function, the objective which is the average error, um, and also the red graph, the red plot. Hopefully this will work. All right, great. So this is the perfect fit. As you see here, it found A and B such that um, from 40 over the root square root of average squared error uh, dropped to 1.8. Six almost, and uh, also you can see actually this is a very good estimation of the original data points here. The red plots, which is our estimation, these are the red plot is just this our estimation, um, kind of overlap or uh, a great fit for um, the actual graph. So we kind of get a very good estimation of the exposure. Any question? Okay, so let's do, assume we can find the response function parameters for all 48 show demographic group combination. We change the previous linear model from chapter two, chapter four to account for this nonlinear approach to total exposure. So let's see actually the other example. Uh, I'm gonna close this one. And this one, and I'm going to open the. So now I'm going to work on the other ex ex example. So it's the add selection data. So I'm going to open that one. That's going to go to the next example for the same problem. Waiting for it to open. Um, All right. I'm sure this okay. This is the ad selection data. The point I'm going to save it as so I wouldn't lose the original data. Um, put it in the tube. Folder and there we go. So that was the first step, right? We did what, what we did was we figured out the we found actually a, an estimation of the exposure as a function of the number of ads um, uh, using an exponential function, right? And so that was a very small sample of data. It doesn't make sense to use that, but very small. So we need to have to uh, figure actually the data. So, so what you see here actually um, is the data for exposure for the six demographic groups, um, men and women, and then also the different shows that we have uh, based on the um, exposure rates. So that's the, the same the same problem that we solved before with linear regression, linear formula. Here we want to solve it with the exponential function that we have. Okay, so this is the constant and um, a constant values here for the different shows that we have here. And these are for B values, the cost per app for these different shows that we have. Um, 
this is going to be our this is going to be our um, decision variable. That's how many advertising we want to run on different shows here, uh, which we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different shows. Okay, and each show has their own cost. It's going to cost differently because you know, the shows are different. They get different um, cost for running an ad on. Right. So the exposure, the exposure that we get depends on what show we, add, we run ads on and how many times we run ads on. Okay. So that's going to be a combination of other distribution variable and um, the exposure variable. So what we are going to do is we're going to use the function that we have, which was, if you remember uh, the exponential, it was a multiplied by one, multiplied by parentheses one minus e to the power of negative b multiplied by x. So we're going to use that function to find the, the, the exposure here, okay? Because you have the x's, you have the a's here, the b's here, and you have the other decision variable. So right now, the, the decision variable is how many how many, assuming that the exposure function or the exposure relationship is the function that we found, which is exponential, um, we're gonna find um, the optimal um, ad plan, which is how many ads we should run on each different program. Okay. So let me, if I forget, I'm gonna use range names for, for this and also for the cost. So these are going to be A's. These are going to be B's. Okay, so this is a function if I want to find um, the relationship. So that's um, A multiplied by parentheses one minus two e to the power of negative B for the same actually show and for the same um, range of age group, multiplied by um, x, which is now x is our decision value. Okay. So I'm just going to give them random values, random add plan here. So I'm going to now copy this for all these shows and also for each demographic groups. We have six of them. So these are going to be our exposure. So this is going to be the exposure for, um, for the revenge show for the demographic group of men between 18 and 35. For example, this one is going to be on the Rachel Ray show for the demographic group of women between 36 and 35 years old. Um, if you remember the, the problem, uh, the, the company, they wanted, they actually had a kind of a requirement for some demographic group uh, for their exposure, okay? So that's why we have actually two, these two rows here. So for each demographic group, I'm going to add up all of these uh, exposure values. So this is the exposure for men between 18 and 35. I'm gonna copy this down. And this is our rec this is the company's required or at least. So that means that they want at least 60 uh, exposure, uh, 60 million exposure for men between 18 and 35, and, and 60 for men between 36 and 55. For example, 28 only for men uh, older than 55 years old. So I'm gonna I'm gonna actually um, be greater, so this has to be greater value here.
I'm also going to name these. Is there going to be an actual exposure? This is going to be required exposure. This is going to make our model in solve the 2D figure. So this is going to be uh, one of our um, constraints. Okay. So do we have everything? We have, we have the cost function here, the cost values, uh, our add plan here, uh, which is our distribution variable. We need um, the constraints for the required exposure for each demographic group, and we need of the objective function, which is the total cost. So the total cost is just going to be the sum product of the sum product, which is sum product of our decision variable, which is our advertising plan, and the cost of running ads on the program. So right now, this is going to be my output. I'm going to use the my output. Um, and this is in dollar value. So this is my output. I'm going to use range name for this as well. You see if I do the total cost. No, I don't want to have it. I'm going to have it. Okay, there we go. Uh, all right. So it, it looks like that's all I, I need to have here. And what else do we need? We actually. You have to make actually these um, advertising plan to be integer. So we need to enforce the integrality constraint. But I'm going to forego it for now, then I'm gonna add the data to see you know, how much that would impact it. So if you relax or forego the integrality constraint, that means that your if you make the constraint that your decision variable has to be integer, if you forego out that your total count, you're gonna Come up with a solution which is your total cost going to be lower. That means kind of beyond your power because integer is like subgroup of all values, right? Um, so let me go to the solver and put the model of our objective function has to be here. We are minimizing the total cost of running ads, and this is going to be our decision variable. Um, I'm going to add the constraints here. So the constraint is the actual exposure for each demographic group has to be at least equal to the lower bound, which is the required amount. And we are having a GRG nonlinear model here because our exposure was nonlinear, right? So because our exposure is nonlinear, the, the actual exposure is using the a to the a multiplied by one minus e to the power of negative b multiplied by x. So that's the, the exposure. So the exposure, because the exposure function is nonlinear, our problem becomes nonlinear and we have to solve it using nonlinear programming. So we cannot use, for example, simple XLP. So I'm gonna use the GLG nonlinear. I'm going to also pick the options here to make the integer optimality person to be equal to zero. That means that I'm gonna get the optimal solution. I don't need the multiple start, so I'm gonna click OK here. Um, and let's solve it. Okay. So this is the optimal solution or optimal ad plan um, for now. But as you notice here, the app plan is not into the value space. And it doesn't make sense to, for example, run 2.79 ad on the Simpson show, okay? All right. So with this ad plan, I have met all of the required exposure to each demographic group. And the cost of this ad, uh, optimal ad is 1556, 1,556, okay? So now I am going to, um, enforce the integrality constraints for the app plan. So I'm going to add, not, I'm going to tab the decision variable to be integer. Okay, so now I have two, I'm gonna run it. As you notice here, it's taking longer time than 
it used to get when we didn't have this reality constraint. Hopefully, this helps. I don't want it too long. Any question before while this is running? All right, so we got to the optimality constraint. All right, so 1557 actually. So that's that's not that bad, right? So it was actually just you know one one thousand exposure, one thousand dollar more, um, and we get um, integer values here. Now. So I can just get rid of these. So our optimal solution is to run five ads on the remain show, three on the Simpsons, 22 on the sport, and 15 on the homeland, eight on Rachel Ray, 13 on CNN, and zero on Google. Okay. Any question? Let me go back to the slide. So we want to do actually some sensitivity analysis here. Um, we did this, we changed the previous linear model into the nonlinear function. Um, we find an old CMD was already there. For each demographic, we made that sure that that happens. Uh, let's also find the optimal as a strategy. How does the nonlinear model solution compare to that from the linear model? Um, you, you can actually figure out on your own, but the ads plan that we get using the nonlinear function, exposure function that we use right now is different from the optimal ad plan that we got when we assume that the exposure is linear function, okay? Uh, also the cost is different. Um, sensitive analysis. So we wanna see how does the total cost change if all required exposure are increased by 10% to 50%. 10% to 50%. So this is, we wanna do a, a solver table here. Um, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna copy paste these values here. And I'm gonna say um, the percentage. Percent change. And say 10%. So this is kind of my input, I'm gonna name it. Um, original. Going to be one plus this multiplied by the region. So now if I didn't change this value, uh, my required would change. Okay? But the model stays the same. Now I can actually run the solver table. This is what the problem asks. It asks us to do a sensitivity analysis on the required if it grows by 10%. Uh, from 10 to 50 percent. 10 to 50 percent. Okay, so let's go to that. And now on the solar table. I think this is going to run really small. This itself, we need to solve the issue this guy here. And that actually will be percent change. The minimum value is 10. The maximum value is. 0.5, the increment is 0.1. One, what I want to see is, is add plan and the total cost. Do you want to use the monetary start? No. And it's running, so it's gonna actually take longer time because it has to run it five times. So, any question? This has to run for a while. 
question, no question? Let me go back here. We saw two of them so far. Three to go. If you do this, it might actually run faster on your computer depending on how much RAM you're using and how much RAM you have, and also how fast your PC are of your computer. The third one is done. Okay, so we are done with this part. I'm just gonna get what is to be done. Uh, I'm gonna open up while this is working. I'm gonna open up the next picture. All right, anyway, let's go to the next lecture. So this is part five um, of the nonlinear models. Uh, we're going to have another one. We're going to solve another type of application, which is the portfolio optimization. Portfolio optimization is regarding investment. If you have final financial background, you might have to, might be familiar with this type of problem. So what we want to do is we want to see, you know, how much we should invest um, percentage-wise in any of the uh, any of the stocks or you know other investment type, um, so that we can achieve some goals. The goal can be um, average rate of return. Um, but also here, as you, you're going to see here, this is the problem is a little bit more complicated because we also want to minimize uh, the risk associated with those portfolio investments. Okay, so let's see. I think the model is done. Yes. You see the cell shade? You see the cell pine? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is. The rate of change here um, from 10% to 15%. Um, these are different ad models that we have um, to prevent SNF, whatever. But that's kind of messed up, so I'm going to undo it. Okay. Um, and this is total cost. Um, if I just go to the total cost function here. As you notice here on this graph, it is the total cost. This is the percentage change from 10% to 50%. Um, it looks almost linear, the relationship between the total cost and the percent change. But if you actually look closer, it is a little bit more than linear okay, to the change. So for example, if I do find the changes here, this minus this, This minus 
Yes. Is there any problems? All right, so it's not exactly linear as you see here, um, but it's close and don't do it correctly. Right? That's what we want to cover. All right, let's go back to the other lecture. Okay, let's go to the portfolio optimization. Um, let's solve or find the optimal ad strategy. Am I not sharing this? So let's solve it, find the optimal address strategy. We, we did that with the solver table. We run the solver uh, um, like um, sensitivity analysis with the change percent change from 10% to 50%. So we are done here. I'm going to go to that kind of close that one. And this is the one. So we want to come up with the best portfolio optimization so that we achieve uh, two kinds of goals. We can have the two approach this problem in two ways. One, one of the goals is to minimize the risk of investment. Any investment is going to have, um, have risk. Right? Um, the other goal is actually to maximize our rate of return. Okay? So there are the risk of investment and the average rate of return. Um, we could go two ways here. One way is to maximize our rate of return or average rate of return of our investment based on the portfolio that we make, um, considering or um, limited to given some sort of constraint on the level of risk that we take. For example, we say that we don't want to take whatever amount of risk, okay? So we can actually enforce the constraints on the risk. Or we could actually do the other way. We can actually minimize the risk of our investment, given that we want to, for example, our rate of return be at least say 14%, 40%, 50%, whatever amount, okay? So there are these two ways that we can approach this problem. Um, here, I'm going to show you actually the second approach. So portfolio, portfolio is a set of investment, it stocks or bonds or funds. And the key question is how much of our, or how much percentage of uh, we should actually, our portfolio should be dedicated or invested in certain stock. Okay? So it's going to be our decision variable, it's going to be you know, how, much, how much we should, what, what is the percentage of, what percentage of the portfolio should be assigned or invested in stock one, in stock two, in stock three, in stock whatever number we have. The financial goals um, is two way, the rate of return or the average rate of return and also the risk of investment. We want the risk of investment to minimize, to be minimized, and also the, the rate of return or the average rate of return to be maximized or we want it high. So we can actually actually approach this two way, as I said, we can either maximize the expected rate of return for our investment, given that or subject to um, our risk of investment be less than a cap or an upper bound or an upper bound. Uh, or we could minimize um, the risk of our investment given that we're subject to um, our rate of return has a, a cap, a lower cap or a lower bound. So we're gonna go actually with minimizing the risk then about. Um, the, we are going to do a little bit too much maybe of uh, statistics here and this is required for getting the values in but it, it doesn't really matter if you don't understand the statistics the statistics of those it's fine the, the problem after I get the values is actually very simple uh, when I have the inputs very simple it's going to be similar to what we have done before 
the kind of challenge that we see here is regarding getting those values, maybe the risk values. Um, it, it actually has a little bit of a statistics too. If you have financial background or statistics kind of background or you have a good skill on statistics, you may actually get it um, you know, better, understand it better, but anyhow, it's, it, it's fine. Um, just bear with me to do the statistics here. So we're gonna do the sum product. If you um, read the textbook, is going to approach it a little bit differently. But the sum product, I think it's uh, it takes a little bit more work, but uh, understanding is actually good. So we're gonna find the um, um, the x, which is our decision variable uh, matrix. So we're gonna do a multiplication of x transpose x transpose by x to get x here. So bear with me as I do this all this computation. Um, all right, set up a small portfolio selection model. We find the optimal allocation using solver, do sensitivity analysis on the core exposure return. This is what we want to do. And in, in order to generate the efficient frontier, what is a frontier or efficient frontier? I'm going to talk about it when we get to the frontier. So uh, before that, we need to learn about how to do this six here. So um, as I said, we need to be careful or, or we are interested in actually in two uh, factor here. One of the factors is the rate of return, and the other factor is the um, risk, which is actually the variance of, uh, of the investment. RI stands for the annual return for investment or stock I. Um, suppose that we have N options here, N stocks or N kind of investment options. Um, so RI is the is a random variable. Uh, as, as you see here, if you just follow uh, the stock market, you see that um, the, the rate of return per day or per month is, is different actually for its fluctuates, right? So it's a random variable, right? So RI is a random variable. What we want to do is we want to actually find the average of it based on the sample data that we have. So it's going to be like the statistics here. XI is going to be the percent of portfolio. It's going to be our decision variable. That means how much of the portfolio or what percentage of portfolio we should invest in a stock one, in a stock two, in a stock three, in a stock whatever number. So XI is the percentage of portfolio invest in a stock I, and we have N options here. These percentages must add up to 100%, of course. So the summation of XI must add up to one. Um, RP stands for the annual uh, return on the portfolio uh, on the entire portfolio. So we're going to actually um, estimate these values based on the historical data that we have here using the sample data. It's called as sample data. Okay. Uh, so estimated mean, uh, because we don't have the R1, R2 here, um, these are just random variable, we're going to estimate those by finding M1, M2, M3, etc. So RI, which is the rate of return, as I said before, is a random variable. It's random and we assume that it follows whatever distribution by an average of mu i and a standard deviation of sigma i. Okay, so this is the population parameters, sigma i and mu i. But as you remember, may you remember from the statistic, we don't know the parameters in the uh, population. So we try to estimate these mu i and sigma i based on the sample data. So since I don't have the mu i, I'm going to estimate that by uh, using the M1 or S1 of the random, whatever you know, uh, level you choose for. So M1 actually is an estimation of R1, M2 is an estimation of R2, and N is an estimation of N. So after we estimate these values, I can find the total rate of return of our report, my portfolio by just multiplying M1 by X1, M2 by X2, and so on and so forth to get to MN by XN. So it's going to be a summation or some product of MI by XI. So let's give you just a, a small example here. Suppose we have actually these three investments. So the first investment here, as you see here, is the rate of return is a random variable and that follows here normal distribution with an average of 13% and a standard deviation of 20%. Okay? If you have another stock um, portfolio, or a stock information, the rate of return for this also follows a normal distribution with an average of 15% rate of return and a standard deviation of 16%. So the second stock on average actually um, has a higher rate of return, but it also has higher risk, 1% higher risk. 
So the risk here is the fluctuation, the deviation or standard deviation of the rate of return. Sometimes it can be negative. Um, the last one here, as you see, hey, sorry, uh, I've written different. So the first one actually has a rate of return of 13% average and a standard deviation of 20%. Uh, the second one, 10% average rate of return and standard deviation of 15%. So a smaller rate of return, but also lower risk. The third one has 15% rate of return average, which is higher than the second one, between uh, higher than the, the, all of them, but um, its rate of return actually is uh, between the first and second. Okay. So if we have these three investment and we kind of invest in, in um, you know, uh, all three, 33% uh, or equal wise, uh, what would be our, output rate of return. The output rate of return also will be a random variable. And if you remember from a statistics, uh, the, it's, its average um, is actually easily can be computed. It's just an average of um, the news here. So the average would be the average of 13%, 10%, and 15%, even how much you actually have your um, percentage of investment on each of these stocks, you can actually easily compute the um, average investment rate of return, okay? So here, because we, I am actually investing equally, that's one third, one third, how much portfolio for stock one, one third for stock two, one third for stock three. My average rate of return would be the average of these average rate of return, which is 12.7%. But to compute the standard deviation of my overall portfolio, that's actually a little bit challenging. And that's the challenge that I thought, uh, as I said, that we're gonna do here. So for that, it's not actually the average of the standard deviation of three, these three investments. We also need to uh, consider the full variation or the correlation between each stock, stock one and stock two, stock two and stock three. Okay. So that's what we need to do. Estimating the variance of RP. This is what I want to do. Finding the, um, the average is easy, as I said. We don't have any problem with that. Just find the average of averages. The standard deviation sigma of P is challenging. So now I want to find the variance of P here. Estimating the variance of RP. Uh, so if you recall from a statistics, SI um, it stands for the average sample or the samples deviation of a stock I return. Okay. CIJ stands for the sample correlation for the sample covariance between a stock I and a stock J, such that the rate on a stock I and J would be, you don't need to actually understand this formula, but this is a formula. It would be um, the average for a stock I minus its average rate of return, uh, multiplied by the rate of return for a stock J minus its average rate of return, divided by n minus one and your sum up for, for all the stocks that you have. Okay. RI and RIJ actually is similar to the CIR, CIJ is the covariance, um, but we are scaling it down um, so that we would actually only get values between negative one and one. So we are dividing the CIJ, the covariance by its minimum is its maximum or a minimum. So it would actually get the between negative one and one, right? Uh, and that's called correlation. So correlation between uh, two stocks. So after we did that, we can compute the uh, variance of um, RP or the rate of return for our portfolio. So the variance would be, if we computed the CIJ, um, the covariance uh, can be estimated using C11, multiplied by X11 plus C12 multiplied by X12 plus C13 multiplied by X13 plus C23 multiplied by X23, so on and so forth. So it's like a matrix uh, multiplication um, for our covariance of the covariance of our stock portfolio multiplied by the portfolio that we have, the percentage of this value. Okay. So that's going to be our variance of rate of return for our portfolio, variance P, okay. so, which is going to be our risk, okay? So if you find the square root of this variance of RP, that's actually the risk of our investment, the risk of our portfolio. 
So a lot of these actually have function in Excel, so you don't need to care about all of this mess up, messy actually composition. You can just use um, Excel function. So we can get Excel to calculate variance either by M mult, uh, matrix multiplication, and also transpose, which is uh, a little bit more difficult. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to go with the second approach, which is using the sum product. But to use the sum product, I need to make, because our portfolio decision variable is just X here, to the percentage um, of my portfolio on extract one, the percentage on extract two, the percentage on extract three. So it's just a list, right? But I have to turn this into actually a matrix of M by M. Right? So in each one, and that's what X, uh, capital X stands for, right? So capital X stands for uh, matrix X stands for when you multiply the transpose X by uh, X itself, X transpose by X, um, you get actually a matrix, right? But um, as I said, if you if you this, this all of this computation is a little bit too much for you, don't 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 worry about it. All of this computation are done to get actually the inputs for the final uh, optimization problem, and um, you, you don't actually have to worry about this computation statistically. Uh, but also, it's very easy to do it in Excel because Excel actually has all these functions to do. It. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. So I'm going to show it actually on Excel, but if you are, want to learn all detail about this, what I do for the sum product and making the matrix, you can actually follow this. Um, this is actually the matrix. So this is my portfolio. Say I have only, only two stock. Say 40% of my stock has to be on a stock. 40% of my portfolio has to be for a stock one, and 60% on stock two. This is my portfolio. And this is actually the X, X the X matrix. Um, I have rows and columns like a matrix N by N, two by two. Three. Um, so it's uh, the, the first row one and column one is actually multiplying X1 and X1. So 0.4 multiplied by 0.4, that's 0.16. Um, row one, column two, that's X1 multiplied by X2, that's 0.4 multiplied by 0.6, which is 0.24, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to skip over that also um, and get actually to uh, Excel. What is the goal, the small portfolio problem? The goal is to find an optimal investment in the three stocks because I, I mean, the problem we have three stocks for simplicity. Uh, we want to minimize the portfolio's variance or minimize the risk of our investment uh, given that or such that or um, subject to a, a, a lower bound on our rate of return or average rate of return. Okay, so we want to go with 14%, but we can do actually a, a, a sensitive analysis on this fact. And also we want to find what is called as efficient frontier, which is on um, show you what it is. So the input data is based on historical data that we have, the annual rate of return for each stock for several years. Uh, we have stocks for apples, we have a stock for Bank of America and for Merck, um, and also this, uh, the average and standard deviation for each um, stock uh, for different years, um, year 14 to 2019, uh, to 2019. And also I'm gonna find a correlation between each pair of stock and also the variance between pair of stock to be able to compute my um, variance of, of the portfolio so that I minimize the risk of that, okay? Kind of the risk. Okay, so let's, you can actually um, open up the files, the portfolio file, and follow along as I do. But again, do not worry about all the computation that I do in the middle to compute the variance because the variance is just one input. Um, that's less of a managerial, you know, decision making for managers for standards um, I wanted to do. Um, some of you may find this no more depending on what we do with the job. There you go. 
Okay. Um, so this is the data file. I'm going to save it as another. I'm going to give it another name. So I can use the original file. Um, we have three stocks. We have a stocks for Apple, for Bank of America, and for Mac. Stock one, stock two, stock three. Stock one is Apple, stock two is Bank of America, stock three is Mac. And these are the historical the history data for this, the rate of return for this historical data. Uh, these are, they actually, they, they're not the rate of return. They are actually the um, price, the price for a specific date on a specific actual year. For example, this is, um, October, the last day of October in 2014, the last day of October in 2015, the same day of October, um, uh, the next year, 16, 17, 18, and 19. So I have it for these uh, six, six years, okay, uh, for the three stocks that I have. So based on this, the prices that I have, um, this is actually data if you are interested in, you can, you can get it from you know, different sources. These are coming from the um, Yahoo.com, financeyahoo.com. Um, now that I have the prices for these three stocks for different years, I can compute the rate of return. So for example, for um, Apple stock one, the rate of return would be on year one, um, say on 2015, if you compare it to 2015, it would be the price in 2015 minus the price uh, in 2014, which is going to give you the price difference in, in this year. Uh, divided by the price in 2014. Um, and that's actually about 1.2%. So now if I drag it to stock three, it's going to compute for me the rate of return for stock one and stock two and stock three for these three uh, for, for year one. And I can actually um, drag it down. So I have these values for So these are my data. Um, all right. And this is the raw data. I need to do some computation again to get the input for my model. The model sheet is here, and this is the model. For my model, I, what I need to do is I need to come to have, um, first of all, um, the, my, my portfolio, which is going to be for example, investment. It's going to be this, this three. Okay, so this is going to be my investment. Um, I'm going to use um, decision thing or decision style here. So this is going to be my uh, decision value. That means how much, I should, how much of my portfolio should be stuck one apple? How much should be? How, how much percent should be um, stuck to the Bank of America? The third one is here. and the rest of this I have to compute. These are going to be my input data. And then there are going to have um, an objective function and also the constraints here. So for example, the portfolio expected rate of return, that's my rate of the average rate of return for my portfolio, which I'm going to compute based on the data that I have on, on the raw data sheet. And I'm going to give it actually enforce it uh, a lower bound. I want my rate of return to be at least 14%. Um, and Computing the portfolio variance, which I'm going to do in raw data page or sheet, I can compute the portfolio standard deviation, which is actually the risk of my portfolio. So I want to minimize the risk of portfolio. So this is going to be actually my um, output. And the output is the square root of the variance, which I'm going to find in draw data. All right. So, yes, to get the input for the model to run, let's do this computation here. Uh, first of all, I'm going to find the minimum, the average um, for this investment. The average rate of return for stock one or Apple. And also the standard deviation. For a standard deviation, because these are samples of data, you can just use the STD. EV, it has actually two formulas, STD 
dot P, which is for population, and dot S, because these are sample data. I'm going to go with dot S, okay? Dot S, then I'm going to pick my uh, rate of return for a stock one from year one to year five, and that's going to give me the standard deviation for uh, a stock one. I'm going to copy for a stock two and a stock three. Okay, so these are standard deviation. Uh, um, and again, my goal in this sheet is here to find the variance of my um, investment portfolio. Okay. Um, okay. So to find the covariance, I, I need to find the covariance. That's actually my, um, this is the co what I want to find, the covariance here. Okay. So I can sample covariance. I can actually make another one. Sample covariance, Excel form. I'm gonna use two ways to do that. On a, one way, I'm going to use the correlation, uh, which is CIJ, that's RIJ, which is the um, correlation of the stock and stock J multiplied by the sample uh, a standard deviation with stock I multiplied by sample standard deviation with stock J, and then this is going to give me uh, the covariance. Okay? And the other way I'm going to just find um, um, the covariance directly using except for me. Okay, so first of all, let's find the correlation. So the, it's correl function, correl. Um, I want to find on the first, let me get rid of this. Um, so to find the covariance, first I can find the correlation and then find the covariance. Um, I can also skip over this and, and, and the covariance directly. Um, so for a stock one and a stock one, a stock one on the row and a stock one on the column, I'm gonna go um, Corel, stock one, it's gonna take two inputs, stock one, come on, stock one, okay? And the correlation is just one, no matter what you do. So I can just go ahead and put one here. So correlation of a stock one and a stock one is one, correlation of stock two and a stock two is one, Correlation of any item with any item itself is, is one. So what I need to do also this metric actually is uh, symmetrical. So I only need to find the stack one and a stack two, a stack one and a stack three, a stack two and a stack two, three. And these three values going to be equal to these three other values above the um, diagonal. Uh, so this is Corel, a stack one and a stack two. So I'm gonna pick a stack one first comma, start to second, and I'm gonna hit enter, and I'll get 0.61, okay? So this is a stock one and a stock three, stock one and stock three. Right. So this value is the correlation between a stock three and a stock one, which is similar to a stock one and a stock three, but I'm going to compute it so you would actually um, see it with your own eyes, okay? Stock three first, then a stock two. So as you see here, this is equal to this one. Um, I'm gonna also compute the correlation between a stock two and a stock three. Stock two, comma, a stock three. But a stock three and a stock two correlation are also the same. So stock two, stock three and two. And I'm not going to do this one because you already did that. Uh, these are the so this is my correlation um, for the stock one and stock two. And I'm doing all of this to get the covariance. The covariance is important to get the, uh, get actually the variance of my portfolio. 
so I can find the risk of portfolio investment. Using Excel function, actually, I can directly actually find um, uh, the covariance, but I can also use the, the correlation. So I'm going to copy this information from the raw data and copy it here. So I need to have my average and a standard deviation of investment return for the stock one and the stock three. Um, I'm gonna only copy the numbers. So um, the inputs for math would stay on, on path. Um, Are we running out of Yes, we are we are over we are over time. Sorry. No one actually reminded me. So please remind me if you want to take a break. So I'm gonna we're gonna take a break and we're gonna come back actually. Uh, all right, we are back. Um going to finish up this table. Um hope everyone is back. I can't see see you, so I can't tell. Um anyway, uh, let me share the screen with you. Um, so this is an optimization model again. Um, what I'm trying to do is to, I have a portfolio. I have three stocks here and this is my portfolio. I want to see how much of my portfolio should be invested in a stock A, how much in a stock B, a stock two, as to how much is stock three. And um, I want to minimize the risk of my investment or the risk of my portfolio. Given that I want to have uh, a minimum of at least 14% rate of return after return on my investment. Okay. Uh, so all of the computation that I did for the correlation, and the, et cetera, it was to find the inputs for this model. Okay, This model, this is my decision variable, which is my portfolio. The objective function is to minimize the standard deviation of or the risk of my portfolio. Okay. So, I copied the uh, inputs from um, the calculation sheet or the raw data sheets for a mean rate of return and a standard deviation into this modeling sheet. And also I'm going to copy the correlation that I found um, to the modeling sheet as values. And now I'm going to find the covariance of a stock one, a stock two, and a stock three. Okay. After I find the covariance, um, I can actually compute the variance of my portfolio, and that's going to give me the uh, risk of my portfolio. All right. So there are two ways to do that. One way is easier one. I'm not sure why we shouldn't go the easy way. Okay. One way is actually to use directly the um, covariance formula from Excel. The other way, as I did it here, I think that's that's what the textbook goes with. That's why we do it, um, is using the correlation first and then computing the covariance section. Okay? So I'm gonna go with the uh, kind of the long way uh, here. So I computed the correlation between the three stocks here. So the values here, as you see here. Um, and now I can find the sample covariance here. Okay? So the sample covariance, what it has to do is he has to, it uses the edge lookup, which is the horizontal lookup versus the V lookup, which is the vertical lookup. So it's gonna multiply, um, this is based on this function, okay, CIJ. The, the covariance of stock I and stock J is equal to the um, RIJ, um, which is the uh, standard deviation multiplied by SI, which is the correlation here, multiplied by SI, which is the, the standard deviation of the stock I multiplied by SJ, which is the standard deviation of stock J, okay? So uh, this is what it does, okay, it's look up. Um, I'm just gonna, don't, don't, don't worry about if you can't figure out the formula, um, it's copied in the data file here. So I'm just gonna copy for all these three stocks. So basically what it does is it's kind of applying this model, RIJ, so for each stock, this is R, R is RIJ um, is one for a stock one and a stock one. So it's gonna go to this um, data set and find a, a stock one, a stock I and a stock J values, standard deviation. So do you see um, F1, 
um, this actually table can three. That means the standard deviation. Okay? So for for a stock I and a stock J, it's going to go to this table and find the standard deviation S I and S J, and it's gonna run it into this formula as you see here, B eleven, which is R I J multiplied by the first one, which is going to find the S I multiplied by the second one, which is going to find the S J. So if I drag it down, I computed the covariance for my data. And now that I have covariance, I can find the matrix for X of a distribution variable. And when, when I multiply X by one, my X by uh, the covariance, it's gonna give me the variance of my portfolio. And that's going to be kind of like this. Okay. So that was kind of a headache losing H, H lookup and, and, and having having have to compute the all of these uh, correlation first. Instead of doing that, I could just um, find the covariance here. Um, so I could just, in the raw data, instead of finding the correlation first and doing all those work, I could just use Excel formula. And the Excel formula is covariance, okay? Co covariance.s, because this is a sample. It asked me to run um, um, a stock one and a stock one. Variance. A stock one and a stock two. Covariance dot s a stock one and a stock two. Stock three, and I also need to find the covariance for a stock two and a stock two. And covariance for stock two and stock three, and the covariance for stock three and stock three. Okay, so the other values are similar. So a stock two and a stock one would be a stock one and a stock two. So this is equal to this one because the matrix is actually. Um, Uh, I actually kind of made a mistake here. So I use the uh, the input values, which are the price is not rate of return. So I have to do that in this matrix. I have to get to that. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to use covariance here. Covariance. So this is for stock one and stock one. Um, this is going to be a stock one and a stock two. And this is going to be for a stock one and a stock three. A stock two and a stock two. Stock two and a stock three. There are optimal, more better way, faster way, productive way to do this. Just in the manual, the stock three and a stock three. Okay, the rest of these are so two and one is one and two is equal to this. Three and one is equal to one and three. Three and two is equal to uh, two and three. So if I actually just copy this to, it should be, and hopefully it is, similar to what I got here. Um, just values. Um, and I'm going to get rid of all of these decimals that I have. 
Um, so if you compare this stack one and a stack one, the same stack one and stack two, the same, the other, this is the same, this is the same. So this is faster. I think this is uh, less headache than computing the correlation first and then using the, the formula, HDCOP, HDCOP, et cetera, et cetera. So all in all, what I cared was to find the covariance, sample covariance, these values. These values are important. Um, um, I'm going to just use another color to just show them here because it's important for us. Um, I'm going to get rid of this much here. Uh, so this is going to be my portfolio. The portfolio should add up actually to one. one that was one of the um, requirement, of course. Required. So this is the summation of my portfolio investment. It's certainly right, right now is Um, five. Thank you. And this has to be exactly equal. Uh, this is actually an input. Okay, this is some, this is required. I'm going to use region for this to make my model so it's all very more readable. And this is my decision variable. I think I've already picked it. I did not. So I'm going to name this my decision value investment plan. What else do I need? Um, okay, now I'm going to compute the X. I need to compute the X here, the matrix X. So this is my investment portfolio. Uh, which is kind of a list of X. So I, I need to find matrix X. Um, if you remember from this here, the matrix X is, is like this. So this is my portfolio for 40% and 60%. A matrix X is a matrix of two by two or three by three or how many investment that you have is N by N. And the first X1 and X1 would be X1 multiplied by X1. Um, cell X1, row one and row two would be X R one multiplied by X two and so on and so forth. So I need to do that. Okay, so I'm going to just gonna copy um, the values here. So this is going to be this this one. This is going to be this one, and this is going to be this one, and this is just going to be this multiplied by this. Um, so for that, I don't want 17 to change. So I'm going to say 17 here. When I use uh, for this, C shouldn't change. Um, so hopefully this works. Let me see. No, didn't work. Of this. So this is this multiplied by C All right, it looks a bit worse. All right, so this is actually my, I'm gonna use just for the sake of it, I'm gonna use different color here because I'm going to multiply this together. These are unconventional, I'm not using convention just to show you that what matrix is on multiplying, okay? So to get the portfolio variance, this is going to be uh, my um, sum product some product of matrix X and the sample covariance that I computed. 
and the portfolio standard deviation is just the, the square root of the square root of this value, which is my um, the portfolio's risk. Okay, so this is the portfolio risk. This is my objective function. Okay, so I'm going to name this. Did I not already? Uh, no, I did not. As my objective function, this is my investment, right? And the portfolio um, expected return. This is um, my one of my criteria. So, using the sum product um, of my investment and um, the rate of average rate of return, which we computed in the program. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to make this a little bit readable, more readable. Um, so we said that we want to have at least like a, a lower bound on the average rate of return of our portfolio. Okay, so um, I'm going to call this say um, required rate of required rate of return. And that was 14%. So this is kind of an input. Um, and I'm gonna name this, did I do it already? Portfolio standard division required portfolio rate of return. So I did not name what I'm gonna rename this here. And this is, has to be, um, less than greater than equal to this value. I'm gonna um, use the symbol greater than equal to for this, and that's it. Um, I'm gonna make this center. All right. So, required rate of return. I don't have it. I'm gonna have the required rate of return. All right, okay. Yeah, it looks like we have everything. We have our decision variable. We have our portfolio rate of return, um, which is constraints here. And we have our objective function, which is the risk of investment. Okay. So I'm gonna go to um, solver and I'm gonna add data everything there. So this is going to be my objective function derivative of the risk here. And I'm minimizing the portfolio standard deviation to the portfolio risk uh, by changing the portfolio values investment. And the constraint has to be this summation has to be whole true. So this has to be equal to one. Also, this has to be greater than equal to 15 percent. Um, right. So why this is a nonlinear programming? Because the, the use the standard deviation variance, everything was nonlinear. Okay, so was nonlinear, that's why this is nonlinear. Um, we can have negative investment, so this has to be picked up. And I'm gonna go to the solver. I want to find the optimal solution. So this is going to be 0%. Uh, I'm not gonna do multi start, so let's go ahead and Run this. So GRG nonlinear. Right. So it says that solver found a solution. All constraints and optimal conditions are satisfied. It says optimal conditions are satisfied. That means that this is our optimal solution. Um, I'm going to make these into percentages. Um, and this is portfolios. Risk. Okay. So it says that only 2% of our portfolio should be invested in a stock one, which is Apple. 65% um, should be invested in, in um, Bank of America, and 33% almost by should be invested, 32.8% should be invested in uh, the third stock, which is uh, Merck. Um, why is that? Because although Apple as a higher rate of return, this is the rate of return. So let me turn this to percentages. 
So Apple compared to stock one and stock two, stock two, Apple has the highest rate of return between these two investments. But it's, um, it has higher risk as well. That means it's fluctuating a lot, okay? So if you are, if your goal is to minimize the risk of your investment, you should not invest much in Apple. Instead, you should invest on a less uh, risky um, risk uh, stock, which is a stock two. So that's why most of your portfolio is dedicated and invested in a stock two and a stock three, only 2% a stock one. Um, but uh, this is going to, this actually can change uh, based on how much rate of return you want to have. So right now we said that at least 14%, if we actually increase the rate of return that we want to have the lower bound here, 14%, suppose that if we increase it to 20%, what you can expect here before I do it um, is you're gonna see that um, we would need to invest more in a higher paid or higher return investment, which is a stock of Apple. So if I increase this, for example, to 20%, you see that in our portfolio, the investment on Apple is gonna go up and the other investments on start to and start to you know, it's gonna go down. Okay, so I'm going to do a, a solver table here um, for that. So, the input cell is this, and that's actually the required rate return. Um, I'm gonna go from 14% to 24% by 2%. And what I want is the stock portfolio and also my risk. No, I don't want to look at start. So you run it here. This is a stock one, this is a stock two, this is a stock one, which is Apple. Um, this is stock two, this is stock two. For, for 22 and 24%, actually that's infeasible. So um, I'm going to actually go back to here and do another analysis here. Um, so I'm gonna go to 20% on 20%. And this is from say, yeah. No. I'm gonna leave this. Okay, so this is this is investment on Apple. This is been on um, Bank of America. And this is the rate of return expect minimum rate of return that we want. So as you can see here right now is 14 for 14 14%. The majority of our investment goes to um, Bank of America and only 2% goes to Apple. But as we increase the rate of return, it's a, a minimum or the lower bound on, on rate of return. The investment on Apple increases uh, as you also can see it here. So the rate of return, the, uh, this is the investment on, on, on Apple, okay? So for 14%, 16%, 18%, and 20%, it goes from 2% to uh, 87, almost 90%, okay? So for, if you're expecting 20% rate of return, at least 20% rate of return on your investment, 87% of your investment portfolio has to be dedicated and invested in Apple. Um, and, and, and nothing on um, Bank of America and only two, 13 per month person almost on, on um, March. You can also see the risk of over inflation. So this is actually what is called as the frontier that I told you. Okay, so this is the frontier um, number. Efficient frontier, frontier, this is the efficient frontier. 
which is the uh, risk of our investment. Okay? So as, as I increase um, the expected rate of work, the, the lower bound on, on my rate of return or the minimum um, the rate of return, uh, the um, risk of my investment goes up, right? So the risk of my investment goes up. Um, you can't have, for example, expect 18% rate of return and, and have a lower um, lower risk of um, 9% or these values, whatever these values. At the, so these are uh, these are the um, and the risk. Okay. So, for example, if the rate of return here, if the um, required rate of return is eighty percent, uh, you would expect to have higher than sixteen point five percent risk associated. You could get a higher rate of return, um, but at a higher risk, but not not vice versa. So you can you cannot get uh, eighteen percent on your investment and at, at a lower risk than sixteen point four. And this is here. And so this is called the efficient frontier. Um, and and you have to look at the efficient frontier from above. That means that okay, this is this is the frontier. That means that okay, this is the frontier. Okay, you can't have any point up here. But there is no point below this that is feasible. Okay, so this is this is the frontier. Lower than that, this this value there is no value. There is no possibility. These are infeasible. Okay, this is the frontier. But above these values are possible. So, for example, you can have eighteen percent rate of return, but at a higher risk. So there, there could be an investment portfolio that gives you eighteen percent of rate of return, but at at a higher risk than than what I have here, uh, what we have here. Um, but not at a lower, lower um, risk. That's impossible. Okay. I think we are done actually with this. We also did the expected rate of return. Um, as I said, we could do the other problem, which is maximizing the rate of return, given that we have an upper bound on other risk, for example, maximizing the rate of return so that my risk um, my portfolio risk would be less than say 5% or something. And so that would be another problem. All right, so this is slide talk about the uh, frontier, efficient frontier. Okay, so we are also done with this. Um, let's go to the other lecture. Any question? So this problem was a little bit too computationally or too, um, uh, too quantitative because I had to compute the input values, which is the covariance or the risk as basically I had to compute it because the average rate of return was just, um, you know, just find using the average function straight ahead. But to find the risk of investment was kind of a little bit of a headache and to give you a fairer uh, perspective on this, the guy who came up with this was uh, an economic, economic uh, the, the, the guy uh, was like an uh, economic. Uh, he actually won, an, uh, I think, a Nobel Prize for this a very long time ago. Um, uh, but he was something, right? So it, it was all the, um, the computation and headache that goes to it. At least back to them. now we have more computation. Any question? So we are going to do the last example um, for nonlinear models. And then uh, we're going to close this chapter. So this, this problem, this last example is for facility location, which is kind of similar to the type of problem that we had done before um, in some ways. Uh, for example, we, we did the hub location for airport, for example, this is kind of similar. Uh, a little bit similar because uh, we have to use the, like a nonlinear function, which is the 
Oclodian, Euclidean uh, distance function between two points, um, which is like the, if you remember from algebra, right, from high school, that how, how you find the, the, the distance between two points. We need to have the dimension x and y for this, and x and y for this, and then you can find actually the square root of x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. That's going to be the distance, the equivalent distance. So this is what we are going to do, and that's what actually makes our model non-linear because of that. So this is a facility location, and the last model and last example is going to solve for non-linear problem. All right, so organization often need to centrally locate in new facility. You might actually be familiar with types of problem depending on what you do for your job. Uh, for example, you work for, for Amazon uh, or you know other, like say, Target or other, uh, other retailers. Uh, a warehouse serving many stores. Uh, so the location of the, uh, this, the location of warehouse is very important. Where should it be? Because it has to be kind of uh, equally distanced to other stores based on the importance of this store. For example, a store is more popular, it has a higher sale, then when you have to actually um, put the warehouse closer to that store. The goal is to minimize the, the distribution cost from warehouse to a store, which is kind of um, a, a function of um, distance between the warehouse and all other stores. Um, a regional hospital, the other application for this would be a region uh, locating a hospital. Uh, that would serve multiple towns or uh, locating actually a fire station, for example, a flagship store serving customers in a wide area. So it has different application, but the problem is the same for everyone. It's just locating a facility um, between multiple um, points. Uh, you want to model, the model is simple, but it's nonlinear because it's using the Euclidean distance. And this is the function for the Euclidean distance, uh, the dimension x1 and x2 for x1. You have two points here, x1 and x2, x1 and y1 for one point for one, say, city or one, one location, and x2 and y2 for another location. The distance between these two points would be the Euclidean distance for the city, which is a nonlinear function and makes our model nonlinear. So let's see actually this example. Consider a small uh, specialty store chain with stores in four cities. So we have Atlanta, Chicago, New York, and okay. so we want to we want to actually look at the best location for for a warehouse to these close to these stores, but based on the weight that these stores has. For example, as you see here, the third the third column it shows the annual shipment for all of these stores. For example, for well, Atlanta. Um, they have 200 um, shipments a year. Uh, Chicago has 320. So Chicago actually is, is more important um, than Atlanta and New York combined. Um, and it's higher than also. Okay, so uh, based on these kind of, this is going to increase its importance. I think it's going to increase its rates. Okay, so based on this importance, we want to. That means that okay, these cities are not equally important for us to, to exactly locate a central location with the same distance from these cities, okay? Uh, Chicago is, is the most important, then Atlanta, then Pittsburgh, then New York, in some ways, right? And, and the second and third columns are just the um, location of X and Y location of these uh, cities. So at Atlanta, for example, east to west, X is 60, for y value is 40, Chicago is 30, x, x is 30, y is 120, and so on and so forth. So we are gonna, gonna model this problem in Excel. Um, I already have this problem on Island. You can actually download it. And this is the data file. I'm going to save it as another name so I wouldn't miss the original file. All right. Does everyone follow everything good? Okay. So this is uh, the input data that we have for the four store cities that we have for Atlanta, Chicago, New York, and Pittsburgh. Um, these two first two columns are for X and Y locations, and the last one is for the weight or the importance and all shipments that we have. And what we are looking for is to locate a facility, to locate a, a, a 
uh, a warehouse. So the X and Y, the location of that warehouse. So this is going to be our decision variable, okay? X and Y for warehouse. So I'm going to um, name this as my warehouse, uh, which is my decision variable. And then I can compute the distance to warehouse here, okay? Um, so that would be the Euclidean function, the square root of x1 minus x2 squared plus x1, y1 minus y2 squared, okay? Um, so a screw RT and that's a square RT, that's just the square root for that, for that x1 minus x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared actually there's a function that's called the um, sum sum m by sum x y x by sum x2 m2 y2 the first one sum x2 m y2 sum x2 m y2 so now i want to find x and y for warehouse and x and y for Atlanta. Um, because you know the warehouse location is just zero here, it doesn't make sense. So I'm going to give it um, some values to start with. Say 20 here and 30. So array X, okay, so array X, that's this one. And this one. B5. Yeah, it works before I'm not sure why it doesn't work now. Okay. So some X. Two and what you send by one is it? But anyway, um, always there is another way to do that. So I'm going to use the other way, the tedious one. So that would be this one minus this one squared plus this one minus this one squared. So I want to do this here. I want to do this here. And that should do. Oh, 
Finally, it works. Um, okay. So that's just the square root of okay, now now it's no. All right. Okay. So these are the distance for each city to the warehouse that I have here. Um, and what we want to do, the you know, our objective function is the total distance traveled or the total distance traveled um, relatively or, or, or in respect to the weight of those cities, okay? Because the cities are not um, the same importance as 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 each other. Um, again, uh, it's based on the annual shift. Okay, so what we can do is use the sum product um, of the distances, the total distances, and the matrix of the uh, the, the list of the respective annual shift, which is kind of a weight for them. Okay, so that would gives us this value here. Um, I'm going to write total distance travel total relative distance with respect to um shipment that's the one name <laughs> so this is going to be my output and I'm gonna name this Long name. All right, that's it. Um, okay. So I actually, we, we can actually plot these uh, point cities here on, on a map kind of thing. So this is um, location. So this is location. I can ask this to add me access title. So this is going to be east, west. And this is going to be north, south. Um, and I can, right now we don't know which of these points are accomplishing or whatever. So I'm gonna go to add data label. So it's gonna, Show this here, but this is not what I want. I want I want a value from cells, and the value from cells has to be these four guys here. And I'm gonna discheck, uncheck these. So now I have the series here. Okay. So this is Atlanta. This is Pittsburgh. This is New York, and this is Chicago. Right. Um, I can also add the warehouse here for us. Let's go and pick up the warehouse. Select data. Uh, this is, I'm going to change this to cities, cities, and I'm going to add the warehouse here. Um, the X value would be this guy, and the Y value would be this guy. So right now, I have to add the label for this too. Finally, all right. 
So right now, the warehouse is just far away from New York and Chicago. It's close to Atlanta, but this is not our optimal solution. So I'm going to solve this problem, um, um, this optimization problem, and the, the warehouse location is going to change and when, when it finds the optimal solution. Okay, so ready? There's no constraints here for us. So I'm just going to go to the solver. I'm going to uh, put our um, the input here. So this is our um, objective value. I want to min minimize that by changing the location of the warehouse, which is this uh, pinky color. Um, we don't have any constraints, so I'm going to skip over the constraints. Um, we can't be, we can't, we can be actually negative. Um, why can't be negative? I want to run this as zero. Run it. Just to... Okay, great. This is the optimal solution. Um, this is where the warehouse should be located. Okay, so the warehouse has to be close to Chicago. And because why is close should be close to Chicago? Because Chicago actually has the highest annual ship, 320. It's, it's bigger than the combined of Atlanta and New York. Um, so that's why it's closer to Chicago than it is Atlanta and New York. And it's closer to uh, Pittsburgh um, than New York because, um, again, the, the weight or the annual ship to New York is smaller than to Pittsburgh. Okay, so we are done with this part too. All right, any question? All right, so we are done with this chapter. Um, uh, let's recap on what we have solved and what have we have done on optimization. The chapter three, we uh, started our linear optimization, optimization problem, linear models, using simple algorithm. Chapter five, we had network models, linear interference that uses special structure, network optimization. Chapter six, we encountered integer programming using the, the or binary zero one decision variables. Chapter eight, we solved the evolutionary models when we had like non smooth function, if you remember. Um, and chapter seven, which is the chapter that we covered um, today, is uh, nonlinear programming, nonlinear optimization models using the GRE nonlinear function. Um, and the rest of this lecture, actually, I have given you three examples of um, com some companies that use optimization models. And, and uh, we don't have enough time to go over it. So um, it's not that important for examining, just for your information. So. I think we are done here. Any question?